interaction between the speakers actually uh, during those sessions because uh, you you squeeze a little bit more wisdom uh, per minute, so it's uh, more uh, efficient in the, the long run. So uh, um, any of the speakers, uh, please feel free to jump in and um, ask any questions and uh, share your own life experiences. And Carl, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for joining us. Oh, fantastic. Well, here, I'll take myself off of mute. Um, really great to be with you guys. And um, uh, I am, as Marcelo was saying just a second ago, um, I'm Carl Ganter, and I'm founder um, of an organization called Circle of Blue. And I'm a journalist, and I like to cover the big stories. So I, I'm a journalist with many tools. So I've covered the stories using reporting, television, and my real passion is still photography. Um, and let me just put up, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you on a quick 20 minute journey. And if I can get my, uh, have to put my keynote on the right button here for view. Um, and hold on, keynote is a little tricky sometimes, please slide show in window. That's what I want. I will share my screen and this looks like the right window and Everybody should be able to see that. Perfect. Great. Um, so what I'm going to do here in a really fast 20 minutes, if that's okay, and hopefully save some time for questions at the end, um, is take you on a journey. Um, I cover what I think is the most important story on the planet, or at least the most connective story, and the one that connects us across culture and history and science and health um, and community, and that's water. And so, as I mentioned, I founded Circle of Blue, and Circle of Blue, we're a, we're a collective of uh, storytellers, journalists, and scientists, and data researchers, all really telling this uh, really critical, critical story about fresh water. This is where I live. I live in, this is where I am today. I'm on the shores of Lake Michigan in Northwest Michigan. So if you hold out your hand, I'm right here. Um, on the shore of your little pinky, um, looking west of Lake Michigan. Um, the Great Lakes, 20% of the world's fresh water, and I'm really honored and inspired to be here. But um, what we're all here about uh, here today is to talk about stories, uh, because we all have a story. And I would argue that many of our stories actually uh, connect through water and through history. And the six words I came up with, we did a little, a little uh, exercise recently. What are your six words about something that's the most important to you, um, particularly a, a grand challenge? And mine were, the irony is the blue planet is thirsty. So here we are on the water planet and the water planet is thirsty. We do face a global water challenge and it's probably one of the most profound challenges um, in our lifetimes. So, what when Matt Damon <laughs> went to Mars, uh, what was the first thing he had to do? Um, he had to make water, right? Uh, if you remember this, um, he, he used some uh, very colorful language around science, um, but he had to have water first and he was going to make it and he had the recipe, take hydrogen, add oxygen and burn. Um, but on our board and a good friend of ours here at Circle of Blue is Jerry Lininger. And he is an astronaut and cosmonaut. And when I asked him about the importance of water in his own ecosystem orbiting the planet, this is what he told me. He said, we're in a closed ecosystem here, only so many sources of life-sustaining water and all the creatures of Earth, just like the three of us circling it, all dependent on water. So imagine being in your own little space capsule. Then in this case, this is the, uh, the Soviet spacecraft Mir. Um, in his words, we're held together with duct tape and, and bailing wire, but imagine that is your ecosystem and just out the window um, is all the water, all the oxygen you need, but in your closed ecosystem to conserve literally every drop and make your drinking water from sweat and urine <laughs> while orbiting in space. Um, charming, right? But I think it's, it's not an understatement to say, you know, I'll remember the movie, if not, uh, watch it, uh, Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. So when we're looking down, when Jerry was looking down on the planet, he really started to understand these systems connections and the connections across continents, continents across stories, across cultures, um, geographies. So he showed me this picture that he took 
and you can see that there are dust storms over Inner Mongolia. And he could see these dust storms reaching across from Inner Mongolia to Beijing, all the way to Los Angeles. And you know what a profound perspective you can imagine. Um, and then of course, I had to ask him and say, okay, what happens if I dropped a golf ball out the window? Throw physics aside, <laughs> yeah, clearly I'm not a physicist, um, but where would it land if he was over this, um, over these, uh, uh, these dust storms? So it would land right about here. And this is Shiling Hot Inner Mongolia. And this is where uh, some of the world's biggest coal mines are located. And so these dust storms were coming from these coal mines. And of course, coal being a you know, fossil fuel, um, uh, exacerbating climate change. But one of the rules and one of the things I hope uh, you'll take away from uh, a few pictures of, of water and storytelling is there are two things that I live by and one is called IWT, I'll come to that in a second, and the other one is a license to be curious. Um, and that's what I love about journalism is that it is your job to be curious. And that's one of my greatest fears would be to ever lose my license, have my license taken away, um, to be curious, to ask a, either usually dumb questions, um, but um, to really just have, a, have that, you know, in a sense, that license. So you saw that picture in the background, and I'll come, come back to this in a second, uh, was a little house uh, on the horizon. And literally when I flew to Inner Mongolia, uh, to go see where Jerry was talking about <laughs> a little difference in perspective. Um, I was circling in the airplane, landing at the airport. Um, there was one taxi outside the door and I said, take me to that little house on the horizon. I had no place to stay. I had no plans except for I knew that I knew that was a, there was one hotel with rooms available um, nearby. And so we drove and we knocked on the door of an inner Mongolian shepherd family and literally, hi, I'm from Michigan. Um, I had a translator with me who was terrified, mortified that this guy from the American Midwest was actually just going to knock on somebody's door um, without having an introduction. But fortunately, the shepherds were home. And this is Wu Yun, and she was the daughter of the, of, the, of the shepherd family. And she told me that these are the coal mines over her shoulders there. And she told me that the mines are draining their water table. And so this is not just a mining story about water. It's a, it's a story about people. It's a story about culture um, and survival. And it's a story that's playing out. We'll come back to Wu Yun in just a moment, but it's playing out around the world. And some of the most important, important issues um, to my screen sharing stop. Sorry, guys. I hope you're seeing pictures here. There we go. I guess it has to be over on this screen. I hope you didn't miss those. Um, anyway, so let's go back. There we go. So that's Wu Yun, in case you didn't see that. That's the coal mine. Up in the upper left hand corner is her home. And so just a couple of just a couple of profound numbers here to think about when we're talking about global water crises. So there are 700 million potential climate refugees be forced to move by 2030 in search of water. And when we think of that, that is incredibly profound. Um, and so that's a good motivator for us to get our acts, our acts together as far as uh, providing safe drinking water um, for people around the world and managing our water supplies. Um, because the future is here ahead of schedule. Um, and you know what, what does that actually mean when I say the future's here? So this is more of the photographs and more of the stories that we've been telling here at Circle of Blue. So in cities like Sao Paulo, you know, for the first time in, in human history, more people are living in cities than ever before. And in Sao Paulo, because of pressures from drought and other in development, um, more and more people are moving to the cities. And this is one of the barrios in Sao Paulo uh, where water is a premium, but the streets are named after the small villages that the people have moved from. And in this case, um, these families have moved here because their crops had failed because of a lack of, a lack of water in the field. Um, this is in Saudi Arabia. This is a Somali shepherd who's actually literally crossed the Red Sea and works as a shepherd um, in, so in Saudi Arabia. So lots of movement due to, due to water. 
Um, one really important thing, and um, I didn't, you know, you guys probably get bios and all that stuff, but uh, while working with the World Economic Forum and their Global Agenda Council on water security, we really have tried to make the case that climate is water and that when we're talking about climate change and we're talking about water supplies, we really need to talk about them together. And I like this quote, which came from an event um, in Stockholm. If climate change is the shark, water is its teeth. Um, and, you know, it's, it truly is interesting when you look at different cities around the world. This is in China. Um, this is in far west China, Rumchi, um, where their water comes from the mountains nearby. Um, this is in Delhi, um, where the combination of groundwater and river water, but you notice that the water isn't, it doesn't necessarily arrive on time um, or predictably because you can count probably a hundred or more uh, water tanks in this picture. I've never actually gone through and dotted each one, uh, but I thought it ironic. There were just two people in the picture of one of the world's most populous cities. Um, this is in Delhi also. What we see in, uh, you know, around the world is people will do whatever it takes to get water. Um, this is an undocumented well um, of thousands of undocumented wells uh, throughout Delhi uh, that people rely on uh, for, for drinking water and water to wash. If you follow the pipe back, there are women doing their laundry in the background. Um, when we also, in, in telling these stories and my curiosity, right, remember I mentioned IWT, um, and I'll tell you what that is, um, is when you're, when you're photographing women planting rice, again, north of Delhi, um, and the water smells like sewage, but it's not quite sewage. It's actually, it smells a lot more like industrial waste. When you go upstream, their wells had gone dry, so they're relying on water, basically waste, wastewater runoff from the paper mills um, for irrigating their crops. So pretty intense um, when areas of the world are running out of water, people are getting much more creative. This is a farmer uh, also outside of Delhi who relies on raw sewage for irrigation. Um, but the farmers, they know that it's not good for them and it's not good for their crops and it's not good for their customers. Um, but they're just hanging on as long as they can. Um, this is outside of Bangor where they wash the beets um, before they take them to market because they're grown in, in raw sewage. Um, and they don't eat their own crops. So little touches around the world of what we're seeing as far as, as, far as water goes. Um, also in other parts of the world when water doesn't have a value um, or when something doesn't have a value like electricity, you might leave the lights on, right? Well, that's what they do in, in Punjab here um, is literally free electricity for farmers. They leave their, they leave their uh, irrigation pumps running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So a major disconnect between perception and reality. And the same thing is happening here in the Delta of the Mekong River. Um, this is probably one of the last rice harvests in this region that I photographed. And this is just a couple of years ago. Um, well, entrepreneurial spirits, they take, they're taking the rice paddies and uh, turning them into um, ponds for growing brine shrimp. Uh, the problem with that is that if you literally turn your camera around and look at, there's the Mekong River um, being held back by, uh, by sticks, mud and plastic from inundated his, um, uh, his shrimp farm. Um, sorry, it's not an all bad story, but, but I'll keep going here. Um, in Jakarta, uh, Jakarta is a city that's sinking. And this is, this is, again, it's a combination water supply, but also what do you do with your wastewater? Um, and it's water and sanitation. You can also not separate those two. This is the sewage is being pumped out over um, into the ocean there. This is the famed seawall that you, if you look up Jakarta and read about up at the circle in the middle um, that is holding back the ocean as the city is settling because of over, overdrafting groundwater um, and with sea level rise. So this is how they're picking up, you've heard of, of course, the plastic issues, um, plastic. So they, uh, they have teams that actually um, go on the shoreline and pick up plastics. Um, but there's a lot to pick up in Indonesia, and this is North Jakarta. 
Um, one of the greatest, one of the really moments of pride for me um, and moments plural is being able to, again, be curious and to meet people like Beryl Carmichael, who's an Aboriginal elder, um, who captured our hearts when we were sitting outside under the stars, having a, a pot of roast kangaroo um, for dinner. Um, she was talking about the history and the flow of water through her lifetime and the lifetimes of, of all who preceded her. 40,000 years of Aboriginal elders and pathways in history flowing through, uh, flowing through the rivers. Um, yes, we're losing the battle. Uh, incrementally, we're losing the battle. Um, overall, we have solutions. Um, we are applying new layers of technology um, to solve some of these challenges. Um, we're also challenging our assumptions, um, our perception versus reality. One of my favorite pictures here too is when talking to, in the data crowd is the world's a click away. We can solve these crises. Well, sometimes the data centers are not quite as <laughs> cut and dry as you think. This is literally the data center from the Punjab Department of Irrigation. And I was very careful not to wake up the servers. Um, really stupid data joke for anybody who's a data geek, uh, but they were asleep in the corner. Um, so truly, this is our moment, uh, COVID, COVID aside, this is really our moment to deliberately design our future. And that's what we're re working really hard to do um, here at Circle of Blue. And, and with many people like the World Economic Forum, with you, with um, uh, Marcella's friends and family. Um, and, you know, how do we do that? Well, you know, I, I call this the suit network of superheroes. Um, kind of only half jokingly um, because you want to hang out with the people who have the talents that you can learn from um, you know truly to take on these grand challenges um, we can't be in our silos the data people can't be over here this you know, the storytellers over here governments and companies we all have to be working together and that's truly what we've been working on here at circle of blue with storytelling marrying storytelling and data um, around water um, because we all truly do have a story. Now, remember, um, I'm just gonna jump ahead a couple pictures here. We have stories to tell in, with data, with pictures. This is, in, um, this is in Hyderabad. Man photographs the river that goes by his home, photographs it every day. And that is, yes, indeed, about six feet of foam on top of the river. I always tell people, whether it's in Davos or whether it's you know, on stage or just in a conversation, these are our moments when we have to reach through the snakes and grab our hats. This is our Indiana Jones moment. It's not a moment for more white papers. It's a moment to truly, truly take action. Um, and when I mentioned IWT, um, IWT, I was asked by, um, by a researcher, a prominent research saying, how did you get your data? And it was very, it was very, very serious. And I said, well, it's on a need to know basis. And so, no, 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 what's your process? And I said, well, it's IWT. And my process is I was there. So these stories, you literally have to be there. Um, I go, when I dive into a story, whether it's data, pictures, et cetera, I always arrive a few days early and I find a family, an indigenous family, whether in the barrios of, of Sao Paulo or a, shep, a, a, a herding family in Inner Mongolia, I stay with them. I invite myself to stay. I'm from the Midwest, so we always show up in time for dinner. So this is Wu Yun. I've been back now four times. Uh, this is the view outside of her, her home the, the second time I visited. Um, notice the swales of sand in the, in the grasslands. Um, those shouldn't be there. Fast forward again, the coal mining, the facilities got bigger. Um, and we used a translate program. Uh, she said they dare not drink the groundwater anymore. Um, but um, there are people like us um, all around the world. And we went on a hike and she handed me her cell phone camera and uh, asked me to take some pictures, which happened to be their engagement portraits. Well, I had my real camera. So I said, let me do this. Um, but to me, when I think of water and I think of these big stories and the stories that we all have to tell, um, I think of people like this family, these three girls um, in the tar desert. Um, I spent uh, 
spent time with with them and their family, they walk uh, probably cumulatively about three hours a day just to get water um, through the heat of the desert. And whenever I think of um, my Great Lakes that are out my window here or anywhere else in the world, um, I think of people like Wu Yun. I think of these uh, young women here who really have such steely resolve and culture and grace um, and passion, um, just like we all do. And that to me is the most exciting thing about telling this water story um, and about hopefully helping other people tell this water story. Um, you know, we always ask ourselves, what are we adding? What are we doing today? What are we adding to the conversation? And for us, I think all of us have a, an opportunity and even an obligation um, to make hope visible. Sometimes it's not. Um, and I think, you know, today and on and forward, um, we have to look at the these grand challenges as collective design challenges. And you'll hear a lot more about an initiative called Designing Water's Future, and you'll hear that you'll hear about that soon, I hope. Um, but I'd ask you all to, you know, what's your superpower? Seriously, um, when we go to, whether it's, again, whether it's going to Davos um, or any other event, conference, location in the world, I always look for people that have uh, that are the action figures, the people that are actually doing work and that are fun to be with and that are, you know, have a shared passion for, for telling these important stories. So I hope that's slightly helpful. Uh, a quick 20 minute journey around the world uh, and the world's water. Any questions or feedback? Thanks so much, Carl, it was great. And I had never seen this presentation and um, I, I knew that he had fabulous uh, photography skills. Uh, now I have the proof. <laughs> yep. Um, I didn't put in one of my first uh, assignments for National Geographic was um, cave diving in Florida. So literally diving into the, into the blue arteries of the earth. Wow. So guys, it's a good opportunity to ask questions because uh, here's a intersection between uh, an artist and uh, a data scientist with a journalistic uh, spice on top. So you want to have many of those specimens out there in the wild. So any questions? Well, I, I could ask about the J before Carl, because I'm always confused. Should I call you <laughs> the J? It means just Carl. So no, if, you wanted, if, if you really want to know, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm James, uh, but my dad was James also. So my sister thought it'd be cool to have a little brother that had a first initial. So forever, your sister can shape your life, your lives. In, 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 the Czech Repub in the Czech Republic, they put J in front of a lot of words like Sen, which is I am, and it's silent. So you could just say, Carl, it's a, it's a Czech word. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's silent. <laughs> You just say it's a check word. Yep. That sounds good. Check review with a K instead of a C, but we won't go there. <laughs> one thing I will say is wonderful pictures. I think um, you know, your photography is amazing. So, oh, well, thanks. And you know, being published in National Geographic, that, that, that's a testament enough because they're, you know, they don't put bad photographs in National Geographic. So. Yeah, the rule, the rule at Geographic was you never told stories about pictures you didn't get unless you, uh, unless you actually had real pictures. <laughs> you, never, yeah. you never made excuses. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, you know, anyway, so I, I, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I think I remember um, I, was, I had a, 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 was it a, a conference or a discussion with, potentially it was, um, well, what's his name, the Nixon Secretary of State. Um, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger. Yeah. And he was talking about how, you know, Middle East and we're having all these troubles. And he said, well, the biggest issue is, is what people don't understand. It's not about oil in the Middle East. It's always about water. It's always yeah. been about water. Every fight, every argument in the Middle East has been about water. And I think, you know, we as humans have been addressing this. We're not making it any better, is what, you know, is, and I agree with you in that sense. And we do. We do we, I mean, for me, this is, you know, a warmer climate potentially we can live with, but we can't live on one without water, right? I mean, fun. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that, and it's, and it, and it, and it can be the great unifier, but it also is, you know, we are seeing more and more uh, conflict um, around water, uh, whether it's regional, um, 
usually not cross border, but we're seeing some, you know, some, you know, potentials for conflict Ethiopia and uh, particularly around managing mass amounts of water and the new dam. Um, but, um, but we also look at this, you have to look at these things on the bright side too, is that um, unusual suspects tend to collaborate. Um, so you see right now, in fact, even Saudi Arabia has a uh, hugely progressive uh, water and zero discharge um, desal campaign. Nice. Um, so that, so, you know, unusual suspects um, stepping up to fill, in a sense, this uh, this call to action. Yeah, and and, and you know, and, and I always I always find the the difficulty when when looking at each of these individual problems is that everyone is so focused on each individual problem. There's plastic. There's you know, there's the rise in temperature. There's the you know, there's the water issue. There's you know, all sorts of different things that people focus on. Yet the problem is not an individual thing, it's a conglomeration of all. But I think our world today tends to be one where um, the media and the way things are reported and the way people activate themselves tends to be on a single issue. And I think sometimes, do, do you see where that sometimes is detrimental because we are not able to have the discussions where we you know, put a lot of these things together and say, well, this is all the big picture. And, you know, while someone says we're not doing enough about plastic, we need to address water first. And then once we address water, then we can worry about the plastic or, you know, so to be able to come up with a reasonable set of things that actually pushes all the goals forward. And I think this is, this is kind of the thing where I'm, I find it, uh, you know, I find it hard to kind of keep tables of because I think there's, you know, for me personally, I think water is the one that will kill us first before, overabundance of plastic and potentially, you know, slightly warmer temperatures on the earth. I think the water is the one that's going to cause the conflicts. It's going to make us, um, you make us fight each other, et cetera. So I'm 100% behind this being one of the, if, if not, the, if you, if you have to rank them in importance for me, this is at the top, but I just get a sense that there's so many people out there pushing so many different things in a mind space where, you know, people, you know, most ordinary people, you know, spend 90% of their lives doing what they need to do for their life. They might have 10% to focus on something like this. And I, I think sometimes they're a bit overwhelmed. Yeah. And that's, and, and it's a really good point. And, and to your, to your, your first note, there was, um, it truly does, it truly is a system. And, you know, the water sector is as guilty as all the others um, at becoming siloed. Water and sanitation tends to be in its own bucket, um, infrastructure in another bucket, governance and all these other, you know, all the other big terms in another bucket. Um, and that's just the water sector. Um, what we've really worked hard at is, is trying to keep a sticky note <laughs> um, stuck to our glasses and saying, Yes, water is important, but it's truly the competition between water, food, and energy in a changing climate. I mean, that's our, our that, that's the systems. Um, and when you talk about plastics, um, most of the plastics uh, are be being deposited in the oceans um, from was it seven or nine of the world's largest rivers. Um, and so, truly, fresh water is the carrier of the plastics to our oceans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and when you solve one of these big issues, you tend to start solving others. Yeah. But I just, I just, I, my, my concern is that I see so many people off each individual trying to solve one of the problems. But if you actually said, well, let's focus our energy on solving, you know, saying here is the, here's the order in which we want to solve them. Let's put our energies one by one, you know, kind of like Bill Gates going off and saying, I'm going to get rid of malaria. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a nice goal, and he's putting almost all of his focus in, in in getting rid of malaria. There are other nasty diseases out there, but he's saying malaria is what I want. He's got he's got enough of his own money and his, his foundation money to go do that, working with governments. And I, I, you're almost thinking that you know, if we're really going to crack this nut around all of these different things and global warming and all of the implications, we probably need a similar kind of mindset where we we this is the grand plan, but step one is I'm in, IT guy. So step one is, you know, build, build this part of the code first because it's critical to the rest of it, right? It's, it's the step, build it, then go off to the next one, go off to the next one. 
Mm-hmm. Nope. And that's, and, and there's a lot of good stuff happening, um, you know, back to, if you want to get involved in these spaces, um, I would really encourage folks to, uh, again, think systemically. Um, don't look for the easy, easy solution. Um, and, you know, I personally believe that, that storytelling and trusted data are really important. Um, and that's why, that's why we do what we do. Um, and, uh, uh, but to really look systemically and where can you make the biggest difference? Um, and uh, in, in this space, it's, it's probably not, you know, tweeting $10 to a charity to drill a well in Africa there, if you're, uh, or in Asia or wherever else that there are, you know, there are water shortages. It's really taking on um, the grand, the bigger structures, the, uh, the governance structures, the finance structures, the cultural structures and the barriers and identifying what those barriers are. Yeah. Okay. This could go on for hours, but thank you. Very much. <laughs> I think my time's up. That was great.